Good afternoon, all. I'm John Getches, Senior Vice President at Ginny May, and I'm going to be the host to this panel and to the rest of you for the next 40 minutes. We are going to pivot a lot of the conversation from this morning of housing policy and economy and drill down a little bit deeper into what it means to the, the bond market, the capital market, and specifically to the mortgage-backed security market of which we all participate in. We have learned throughout the day and reading the newspapers and checking our smartphones that there's lots of headlines that keep us very active. We have tariff and trade wars, we have Brexit, slower growth expectations we saw is starting to enter into the um, equity evaluations uh, and slow down in GDP. We have long-term aging demographics as well as, as challenging climate patterns that are affecting economic engines of certain, of certain economies. And we have technology challenges too. <laughs> So yes, volatility has re-entered our, our room. It has arrived in global markets and our mortgage markets. As such, we are presented with the challenges and the wonderful opportunities that allow us to participate in a highly liquid market. This panel will cover important aspects of the MBS in this environment, namely the prepayments and relative value propositions. I am fortunate and we are fortunate to have three panelists join us. They are well practiced, they're long in experience, and many of them have contributed to the evolution of this mortgage-backed security market. I've tallied up their experience. These three gentlemen contribute 100 years of experience in this market space, have seen a lot of turns and different volatility and a lot of different uh, challenges, so I think we're well prepared uh, to address uh, what, what's about. Briefly, um, let me introduce my, my panel. Scott Buchta, to my immediate left, is Managing Director and Head of Fixed Income Strategy at Breen Capital. Scott provides market insight and cross-sector relative value trades to client base that includes banks, credit unions, pension funds, and insurance companies. He also has opinions on interest rates, the mortgage-backed security market, and is at Breen Capital a very big supporter of specified pools and our reverse mortgage HMBS security. So I welcome Scott. Uh, the immediate left of Scott is Mark Dukotsky. Mark is a partner and managing director and head manager for all MBS ABS credit at Ellington Capital. Um, actually, Ellington Management Group, which serves as, as an external manager to two publicly traded uh, uh, companies Ellington Financial and Ellington Residential Mortgage REIT. Mark brings with him uh, many years of experience and he has the perspective as running money in these asset classes so he has gravely and entertained uh, many environments that challenge the valuation of MBS. And finally Chris Flanagan to the far left is head of US Mortgage and Structured Finance at Bank of America Securities. Chris is our senior tenure member here with over 34 years of experience. He has witnessed quite a bit of changes and actually probably the development of the mortgage-backed security market throughout its prominent adolescence. Chris has had tenures at Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, and a return trip to Bank of America Merrill Lynch where he now um, serves. You probably all recognize Chris as he's a frequent nominee and participant and regarded in the um, all-American Fixed Income Research Team. So these are my panelists, and I think we're gonna um, start the process. If we could show the slide. So I think earlier today, uh, one of our panelists say we can, we can debate our opinions, but we can't deny facts. Here's our facts, that's where the tenure has traveled. Um, abruptly over 120 basis points in seven months, and that's what brings us all here. So with that, I, I follow the first question is, what is this big interest rate move um, to the MBS market? Scott, why don't you? Uh... Thanks, John. So the, the big thing we've had, if we had this conversation in this conference in November, we'd be talking about how refi indexes are at their all-time lows, and there's less than 7% of the borrowers out there that have the opportunity to refinance their mortgages. Mortgage rates have fallen 100 basis points over the last six months, with the last 50 basis points really over the last three or four months being the more important. 
we've gone from 250 billion refinanceable mortgages to almost 2 trillion. 800 billion of those are Ginnie Mae. And what we're seeing in this market right now is how are we going to adjust our models to all this refinanceability? And in the current market, when you look at the concentration of mortgages that have been created in the last two or three years, it's really a game of eights. Every eighth of a point move in primary rates impacts $300 billion worth of borg, uh, borrowers, about one third of those Ginnie Mae. So as we look at models and as we look at the impact uh, on the mortgage market and prepayments as a whole, we're right now at, at the lowest level in two years in the market, and, and it's definitely going to bring about a lot of changes. And I think a lot of the models will, will have to adjust to this, and, and we'll see how well we predict. And we're going to talk about that, I know, in question two. But right now, I think that's the big picture. And then we're also going to be looking at just you know the first responders. It's the borrowers with the largest loan sizes and the least amount of friction. And a lot of that does exist with the FHA and v, VA streamlined products. Mark, what's your take on it with respect to asset management? So I think with mortgage investing, prepayment risk is always there. You know, when the 10-year note's 324, the high point on the chart, prepayment risk is latent. And now at 207, it's in full bloom. So for mortgage investors that, you know, have the serious job of managing money for bank portfolios or pension funds, it's always... Um, the job is always to assess what's the prepayment risk and am I getting paid an appropriate spread over treasuries for taking that risk. So I think a few things you know, are clear to us. One is that the mortgage market is a very important transmission mechanism for Fed policy and for interest rate outlooks. So as you've seen the market pricing in um, cuts from the Fed as opposed to hikes it was pricing in November, Mortgage rates have dropped a lot, and that has done a lot to increase mortgage affordability. So there is a stimulative effect of this lower mortgage rate, which is important as um, people price in the slowing economy. I think within the mortgage market, you know, investors have a tremendous amount of data. And so there is such a diverse group of loans with which to choose from loans down to $60,000, you know, in the Gini program. Um, the uh, Section 184 programs, the rural housing programs, that there are many, many parts of the mortgage market that offer call protection almost comparable to the corporate market. And with the proper amount of data and well-staffed research groups, mortgage investors have a lot of tools at their disposal to manage the interest rate risk that's going on in the market now. Chris? So I, I thought answering this question, the first word on the question sheet, two words, interest rates. You know, I stepped back and looked at um, some of the opinions among my colleagues at, at Bank of America, and we have an enormous amount of research people expressing views on interest rates across, across the globe. So we'll have folks from Asia. We have our economists, of course, making rate calls. We have um, our corporate strategist uh, sort of offering views. And I, I think, you know, pulling them all together, I, you know, this chart here is about, you know, what's happened so far. But I, I think, you know, the question that sort of jumps out, out to me, and, you know, certainly at 324 last year, most people probably did not anticipate we'd be looking at a 207 number, you know, this quickly after. And so, you know, thinking forward, I think you know there's sort of the two stories uh, I would say that dominate for this year. One is the growth story, where you know perhaps perhaps people, including the Fed, were a little over optimistic about growth uh, late last year. And then of course there is the trade and tariff story. And you know I, I think the the latter story is particularly interesting of what you know some of my colleagues are are, are talking about in, in terms of how they're thinking of it. And um, one in particular, uh, yesterday we had a note come out from our uh, defense stock analyst and looking at it, the trade war perspective and, and thinking about you know, it from his coverage perspective. And uh, you know, I think he was almost the first one that I had seen internally who really kind of took the, the conversation up from just the simple economics of trade up to sort of the geopolitical 
considerations. And you know what I thought was very interesting about that, particularly in the context of what's happened so far this year, is that you know there's a certain unresolvability, I would say, that it's bigger than just you know sort of trade. And you know, to me, when you start collecting all the various views from our my colleagues, um, you know, a lot of it ends up like saying that 2.07 percent number, you know, in the next seven to 12 months is very likely to have, you know, a one handle on it, you know, so that not only do we have to, for the mortgage market, um, think about, uh, you know, convexity and models at, at this current level of where we're at, but the idea that, you know, we're potentially from global, you know, factors and phenomena moving to a point where, you know, we're going to be looking at even lower rates. And I think, you know, from the mortgage market perspective, let's say we have two two sides of that. There's the, the investor side. How do we manage convexity um, in, into that sort of scenario? What's some of the particular idiosyncratic stories around, say, Ginnie Mae prepayments? Um, but I think also the origination side of it is just, you know, if we're at a close to or a sub 4% 30 year mortgage rate right now, are we looking, you know, at somewhere in the, you know, back to the 2016 levels again, we're in the, the you know, sub 350 on the 30 year mortgage rate and, you know, what that can do obviously for origination opportunities. And, um, you know, I think also the housing market and I'll, I'll sort of wrap it up on this comment, but, you know, at, at 324, as, as Mark, you suggested, you know, affordability was really struggling in the housing market, you know, at 390, it's a lot better, and at 340, it's going to be, you know, a whole lot better again. So I, I, you know, continue to, like we've had as a consistent theme for the last 10 years of, you know, global problems are sort of great for the U.S. housing market. And we've been like sort of constant bulls around mortgage credit of like, we'll take these problems overseas because it just means we keep getting low mortgage rates and it just sort of continues to drive, you know, the housing and mortgage market recovery for the post-crisis period. So I think it's just important to understand that not only have we, have we moved dramatically already, you know, the consensus of views from a number of my colleagues at B of A, and, and everybody's sort of arriving at it from a different angle, is that chances are pretty good we're, we're going even lower on these rates. So with that, we would expect certainly the avalanche of refinancing, but we also have the brighter spot of affordability starting to re-enter in for, for purchase money mortgages, et cetera. So we have a lot of gross supply, and we're going to have some net supply start to increase. Do you gentlemen think we have enough liquidity and functioning in the marketplace and interest in the product itself where pricing allows things to adjust, or do we have some, some timeouts that start to occur? Is it that abrupt? Anyone? Scott, you want to? I, I think there's plenty of liquidity in the market right now. I think that you, you look at the mortgage market, and there's some other slides and some other panels, but certainly liquidity in Ginnie Mays and liquidity in conventionals as a whole is very strong. It's, it's roughly 30% of the, the aggregate index, and, and I think the liquidity is going to be there, um, especially in the multi-issuer pools. Um, one thing to your point, though, about lower rates and affordability is, is over the last six months, the average borrower has recovered 12% of their purchasing power. So I think that's going to be supportive of housing, it's going to be supportive of, of turnover, and it's going to be supportive of, of purchase loans. I think there is a um, ample demand in the mortgage market now because what's interesting is you're getting this backdrop of low rates but if you look at where corporate spreads are, they're very tight, right? So the market is saying this potentially Fed rate cuts and slower economic growth, but it has um, corporate spreads don't evidence any concerns about um, a, uh, you know, increasing defaults. So on a relative basis, mortgages, especially Jenny's with the full faith and credit, they're relatively wide versus um, investigated corporate bonds now. And there has been a lot written about the change in the composition of the investment grade market in the past 10 years, how it's, there's a much larger percentage of uh, triple B rated securities than there used to be. So if you go back and regress historically, mortgage spreads versus corporate spreads, it doesn't even give you the full picture of relative value in mortgages because the um, corporate composite by which you're comparing them has migrated a little bit down in ratings. The other thing, 
I would say is that as you see this drop in interest rates occur, you know, each mortgage now has less and less duration, right? So now you're at a point in the mortgage market where you have relatively low durations on them. And so versus the front of the, uh, front of the treasury curve, there's a lot of mortgages with, you know, pretty substantial spreads. So I think, I think what's important for investors is, isn't that you're going to have this increase in prepayments, right? That's sort of a historical fact in the mortgage market. It's whether prepayments behave in the way that's consistent with um, historical data. And so really the essence of mortgage investing is making conditional predictions, right? So if you say, I don't know where rates are going to go, but given a certain set of loan attributes, you know, loan size, credit score, LTV, for different levels of rate incentive, I think loans are going to prepay at a certain level, where I think the role of Ginny Mae and the role of uh, Fannie and Freddie is to make sure that the um, players involved are behaving according to the rules and you don't have um, originators that are generating prepayment patterns that are substantially different than um, the broader cohort. Because when you have a TBA market, which is you know, kind of the lifeblood of the mortgage market, the, mar the price of TBAs is set by the marginal originator. And it can be a relatively small amount of um, the composition of a cohort that really drives the TBA price. So the marginal, um, the marginal issuer that's delivering the most negative convexity is a big component of the mortgage market. And so I think, and you've seen it historically how, you know, GSEs and Ginny may have policed originators over time when origination speeds seem like they're either not consistent with the spirit of guidelines or really in violation of guidelines. And I think that is, that's a very important protection. And you're going to see also, I think, um, increasing technology in the mortgage market. And it was interesting sort of right after the mortgage crisis, you know, after 2008, you saw really an era of kind of wet blanket mortgage speeds, where mortgage speeds were very slow relative to incentives. But you have seen big technology spends on the part of originators as well as um, GSEs, and now some of the technology is um, uh, affecting prepayment responsiveness. You know, Fannie and Freddie have disclosed a lot about um, property inspection waivers, which is a real benefit to borrowers. And I think as long as those things happen with appropriate data disclosure, which in that case it has, investors have a chance to calibrate their models, update their models, and price accordingly. That's a great segue now, I guess. So what you're saying here is, is, is endorsing what the Secretary said at, at the luncheon speak, is, is that change is constant, and it's going to be constant in, in the models that we predict and the expectations of prepayment. Chris, uh, you started at Merrill Lynch as, as a mortgage analyst. You have a degree in applied physics and electrical engineering. You probably had a lot of input over your career to, to prepayment models. Sitting today, what, what, should we, what should we look at as, as the big factors here of adjustments? So, you know, I think the, the thing you can very easily say about models, um, as you say, cha change is constant, and you're very likely, you know, to almost always get something wrong when you're, when you're modeling and predicting speeds. I, I was going through our latest, uh, you know, model report, and, you know, I actually was pretty much for every coupon, like even the, throughout the specified space, both Ginny's conventionals, over the last three months, we were within one or two CPR of, of what played out. So I, I feel pretty good overall about, you know, our ability to harness all of the data that's out there. You know, it's, it's the basics of starting with S curves to understand refi incentives to you know start layering on uh, you know some of the specified pool stories, some cohort stories or, or vintage stories to understand you know some of these idiosyncrasies that are emerging you know for different age buckets. Very important. Obviously, the role of uh, housing and home price growth, building up equity, creating you know refinancing and cash out refinancing opportunities 
that that's very important. Scott, you referred to just you know sort of going after the big loans first, the lower friction guys. But you know, I, I think you know to your point, Mark, with the with the technology, you know, you continue on the on the origination side to just get better and better at mining the data and being able to you know process borrowers across the spectrum, you know, fairly easily. So. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, I've been doing this for uh, many, many years. I remember like the first big refi wave, let's say in the early 90s and, you know, the so-called media effect that just shocked people to, you know, to the upside on speeds. And it just seems like that's almost one of the most constant stories of the mortgage market is that there's always some niche in the market where somehow or another, you know, mortgage bankers have figured out how to refi people very aggressively. So. You know, we had some of those happening in the last few months. We kind of expect to o always have those, but I think by and large, you know, the, our ability to model is pretty good, and the you know the market's ability to model, given the vast history of, of data that we have, uh, it, it is pretty good. But it doesn't mean that you know the number. The only risk we're really talking about here is prepayment risk. We're not really here to talk about credit risk at all, and so. You know, when you invest in these securities, you're taking on that risk, and you're you're going to get it wrong in some instances. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of you know smart me people putting money to work who have also have very good models, and you know you're you're up against everybody and sort of how you're pricing that out. And you know the chances are good you're going to make some mistakes, but on the other hand, you know everybody I think has a lot of information at their disposal where they can make some you know highly informed decisions. So with respect to what we have learned and observed here is, is that uh, the most intriguing research that I, I like to read is, is this concept of what, what is the break point of in the money, out of the money in terms of the coupons. Um, Scott, what do you think is, is, is the break point on, on that spread right. to, to it, trigger refi? It used to be, when you think about S-curves, um, about 50 basis points was, was really what was thought of as, as, as the point where, where you really start seeing prepays go up. The last two refi waves, especially if you think 2012 and 13, that was much higher. Um, and a lot of that was because you had home prices that were down that didn't allow people to refinance. I think today we've gone from 60 to 50, and I think now three-eighths of a point. And, and to your point uh, with, with FinTech, you can, as soon as you see a borrower's in the money, or if you see a borrower's FICO is improved to the point, you can send an email and say, hey, you can refinance. And, and I think right now, because of a lot of the technology has lowered costs, I think that S-curve really starts to, to pick up, especially in the larger balance loans at three-eighths of a point. We still use 50 basis points as a calibration, but I think you can see stuff at three eighths. So we would suggest that uh, a Gini two coupon at the cusp is somewhere less than four, four coupon? Um, I think right now three and a halves, we actually saw prepayments last month pick up. But the one thing with Gini May is you still have the 50 basis point or 5% net tangible benefits. So actually your refis have been less severe in the early months than, than Freddie and Fannie because you've got that six month, 210 day waiting period and you've got a hard 50 basis points. So actually you've seen the Fannie and Freddie pools start to pick up steam earlier. So what do, we, what do we do in terms of the market functions well, the models get readjusted. As, as Mark points out, there's asset uh, allocations that are available to us. So if we have to stay in the mortgage space, where can we start to find these values that have protection against prepayment? Mark, how do you look at basically these specified pools, call protection, niche markets that you talked about? I think you have to think like a party to the transaction. So there's two parties to a refinance transaction. There's the borrower and there's the lender, right? And sort of historically, the best, most consistent, most predictable call protection in the mortgage market has been um, by selecting lower loan balance pools, right? So LLBs under 85K or MLBs under 110K. And, and you'll obviously see that if you look at the data and fit a parameterized model. But if you think about how the world looks to each of those parties, it makes so much sense, right? So if you're a borrower in a $60,000 loan, the per dollar amount of savings every month from refinancing and savings 50 basis points 
is very low, right? So you have a certain amount of hassle factor which results in very little savings. And now if you're an originator now, and one consequence of uh, 2008 and the global financial crisis, you know, almost the entire regulatory response was aimed at the mortgage market, was sort of housing, was sort of the epicenter. So Fannie and Freddie um, didn't change their guidelines. Everything's income verified with W-2s or 1040s. There's been this change in the appraisal process. So, so there's a certain amount of fixed costs and a certain amount of um, labor inputs in the mortgage space that have gone up a lot from what they were pre-crisis. So if you're an originator with fixed costs and you're going to sell a $60,000 loan into the market that you put into a pool or a $400,000 loan into the market, you know, if, you're, if your total amount of profit is relatively fixed, the per dollar profit is so much lower on the low loan, low loan balance pools. So that's why the loan balance is something that, yes, there'll be technology and there'll be slight changes to the S-curve, but it's been a tried and true source of call protection because neither borrower or lender is particularly interested in that transaction. Um, the other thing I would say is that there is an interesting, complex, nuanced set of housing finance authorities that um, you know originate through you know both UMBS as well as Ginny May. Some of those programs offer substantial call protection, and so it's. I, I think what's great about the mortgage market investing to me. It's always about finding the cleanest, dirty shirt, right? Like when you look at everything, the risk rewards and everything. So you look at mortgage market now. Yes, prepayments are going to are going to go up predictably in response to this drop in rates. But you look at the corporate market; spreads are very tight, and there's a tremendous amount of issuance. And you look at the treasury market. Treasury market is going through a an enormous issuance cycle by virtue of the size of the deficits where all, where the country's running. So when you sort of weigh them all for investors with investment grade um, mandates, right, I think on a relative basis, the mortgage market looks pretty good right now. And I think what the, you know, I've been doing this a while, but I think what's great about the mortgage market now, which you didn't have 30 years ago, is 30 years of data, right? You have 30 years of data, and I give the GSEs and Ginny Mae a lot of credit for the integrity and the consistency with which they report many, many fields of data with which investors can analyze and come up with, to Chris's point, very accurate predictive models on of prepayment. So being a mortgage investor now versus being a mortgage investor back in the 80s, you are, your decisions you're making are informed by such a tremendous wealth of statistical data. And, you know, there's a component to prepayments, which is sort of behavioral economics and human nature, and that hasn't changed over time. So thinking about, I'm this borrower, what's the hassle factor I have to go to to refinance for what dollar savings gets you a long way towards understanding why prepayments are what they are, conditional on the GSEs and Ginnie Mays policing um, the integrity of their programs. And, you know, right after the crisis, banks had had to suffer, um, you know, banks were charged, you know, banks had to pay a lot of fines. They were relatively unaggressive on mortgage lending. They weren't operating at the, uh, you know, the edges of the credit box. Slowly over time, that's, um, that's changing. You've seen, um, you know, some of the day one cer certainty initiatives coming out of the GSE. So technology will be there. Technology is evolving. But as long as data is made available, I think investors have a lot of tools to capture the significant spread mortgages have over treasuries. Scott, how do you advise your clients? You spend most of your time on where the cross-sector trade is or, or value premise. Yeah, I, I think the, the interesting thing is you look over the last couple of years is the growth in the Ginny May market is you've gone from roughly 10 to 15 percent of the index to 30. So it, it's an area that a lot of investors have to manage now and you've got to incorporate that into your, into your thoughts. And one of the disadvantages right now to, to Ginny May is the non-deliverability of, of the custom pools or the spec pools. Now, 
we can talk about the value of, of the spec pools in the higher coupons, but as an asset manager, I can go to Freddie and Fannie in the production coupons, threes and three and a halves, and I can buy spec pools. In fact, 30% of all Freddie and Fannie origination every month is in spec pool form. That number for Ginny Mae is 18%. And if you look at the production coupons, threes and three and a halves, it's actually less than 3% for each. So there's a real problem with the growth in Ginny Mae, but then the growth in relative value in the production coupons where a lot of the supply is. And that's really kind of causing a conundrum for a lot of the money managers because they'd really like to buy relative value, but it doesn't exist um, in those coupons because right now the bid's not there. So if you're originating spec pools or you're a, 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 a lender that plays by the rules and has better than average speeds, you're not allowed to capitalize on that because your best execution is the multi. Um, so it's really kind of hard. So a lot of our investors away from the multi buy the new one and roll it in six months. Um, the only real spot we, we can really play, to, to your point, is in the, in the uh, premium customs. So what I hear you say and suggest that, that Ginny May should try to consider uh, specified pools being, uh, at least by certain guidelines, um, deliverable. Correct. I think that would help, help the market. It would help issuers and it would, it would help borrowers. Mark, you buy assets that look for call protection. Is, is that seen as a positive opportunity for you, or, or does it start to take away from the TBA itself? How do you view that as an asset manager? Yeah, you know, what Scott raised is a great point, right? So in Fannie Freddie space, you have your choice of TBA, you have your choice of spec pools, and most of the spec pools in Fannie Freddie space are deliverable, except for the CKs and the, you know, the heart pools. And in Ginny's, it's, um, it's not that story. It's, it's not that way. So given the big pay-ups between Ginny 2, 3 NAS versus Fannie's, those are like 27 ticks. And in 3Space, pay-ups over a point, the uh, originators are putting everything into the Ginny 2, 3 and 3 and half major. And you can't select call-protected pools there. Um, I'm of two minds. I do think the Ginny 2 major program has brought a lot of liquidity to Ginny Mae, and that's been a good thing. Um, I think with customs, given that they're not in the index, so you get kind of a chronic underweight from some of the money managers, we see a lot of value in the customs, but I think you need to get paid something for the difference in liquidity. So in terms of expected return, we would never buy customs at the same level as where we buy Gini 2s, right? There, need to be, there needs to be an OAS premium built into it. But, you know, what's interesting is I look back at some of the things that we've done in the past six months, and you always look back, and, you know, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, some things you did looked like you were a genius, some things looked like you were a moron. And so I look at the pricing of where some of these very strongly call protected pools were six months ago, and it was very, very cheap. So given that my view of the world is that interest rates are pretty unpredictable, we will go down in liquidity and favor call protection when we feel like there's a big expected return pickup. But there's got to be an expected return pickup to give up liquidity because like one of our principles is, you know, a lot of things. Never go down in credit unless you're getting paid for it. Never go down in liquidity unless you're getting paid for it. Never go up in complexity if you're getting paid for it. And so with customs, a lot of times I feel like you get paid for it. So from the Ginny Mae mission perspective in, in, in our charter is, is to continue to develop and assure that there's a secondary market, highly liquid, to, to basically haul quite large volumes. As I think Scott pointed out, 30% uh, of, of the activity is uh, created in uh, Ginny Mays these days. That's a peak. We're very prominent to the Barclays or the Bloomberg in the indices. Um, Chris, does that, are we chronically underweighted among, among money managers from your perspective of what you observed there? So because of that specified non-deliverable. I, I think um, you know, some of the, the perspective I would have on this is, let's say the bigger picture this year of the rotation and um, with the Fed just overall shrinking it, its MBS 
holdings. Um, you know, there was some discussion in the earlier panel to go through and, and, and figure out, you know, banks, are they stepping up? Um, overseas investors, are they stepping up? I, I think, you know, one interesting point to note, and this I think is, is very germane for Ginny May, is that, you know, probably within two years, overseas investors will be the second largest holders of agency MBS. So, um, you know, it's, it's clearly a very prominent part of the market. So, you know, I, I think, and, and as the earlier discussions, you know, spoke to today, um, money managers are kind of the plug buyer that will, will step in and seek value, relative value. And, and I think, you know, perhaps they've been underway, but I think there's been, you know, clear preference shifts where they're starting to look at the uh, agency MBS market and, you know, in aggregate and, and see value. And so, you know, I think if, to Mark's point, if there are pockets of value, you know, derived from liquidity, I think, you know, the rotation that's underway means that they'll probably will be, you know, sort of on the path higher in terms of Ginny May exposure. It, it feels as if, you know, over the last six months as the Fed is, is kind of underway with the exit more aggressively, um, you know, there is a rotation in terms of money managers becoming a more prominent presence and, you know, it will be a relative value, you know, at the end of the day, a relative value pers perspective compared to, say, corporates and the ability to get earned spread over treasuries. So what I hear is all of you are very confident of riding this market through, seizing the opportunities, adjusting your models. Mm -hmm. Let's switch a little bit to recommendations uh, of, of the Ginny May product itself, refinements. Uh, a month ago, Ginny May, Ginny May um, put out an RFI, Request for Information, for everyone to comment on what we felt was certain behaviors that there were rapid refinancing that had nothing to do with economics per se, meaning that loans were being created that were immediately in the money, and when our, they got to the seventh or eighth month, the uh, the S curves and, and CPR curves, just vectors uh, skyrocketed quite a bit. Um, Scott, you were kind enough to, to give some research on that. What, what, what's your thinking? What, what, what would you advise us? So I, I thought the RFI was, was a very good thing. Um, and I, I'm assuming that you got a lot of, of, of good responses. I think that when I think about some of the things, if you're going to put policy in place, make sure it, it sticks and it's uniform and, and it can't be circumvented. Um, one of the problems with the, the VA penalty box was lenders could sell service and release and those loans ended up in the multi anyway. So you really couldn't enforce it. Um, one of the dangers I see about lowering what can be included in the multi issuer to a 90% cash out refi is you are actually set, creating the setup loan in the 90 to 100 bucket if that loan is much more expensive. I, I think there might be better ways to do it, such as if you do a cash out refi, you can't put that in another pool for 12 months, right? You, you might put up a little bit of protection there or limit the number of cash out refis you can do over a set period of time. Um, I think one of the other things that makes sense, and, and your allusion, you know, and it's a technology thing to what the GSEs are doing with the waivers, but they also have an AVI model to calculate the LTVs. And I, and I think if you know, the majority of your cash outs are pegged at 100 and pegged at 85, um, but a lot of them in, in FHA show up after 12 months, you know, where you've got a, a 100 LTV loan doing a ca And so from the FHA's point of view, you might think you're underwriting an 85 LTV loan, but cash out, but it might really be a 95 LTV. So I think there's some technological things that you can do that are checks and balances that might bring things in line and really kind of do things to, to make the program better. And, but it's any policy decisions you make, really it'd be great to make them uniform and, and really harder to get around. Mark, I'm gonna give you a last say. We're gonna count down to 17 seconds, but I'm gonna give you an extra minute. What okay. Do you think of RFI, what should we do? What, what's your thoughts on improvement to that? Yeah. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I, I think People talk about non-bank lenders, and that, that shouldn't be considered a pejorative term, right? They play a really important role, and they, for there, providing liquidity and capital to the markets at a time when the banks pulled back. So, you know, they're a very valuable constituent. But I think one thing for Ginny May to focus on is the fact that you've had a big exodus of banks, right? And 
You know, I think about our clients. You know, what's nice about banks is they are highly regulated entities. They're well capitalized. A lot of them have very large technology spends, so they're in a good place to have sophisticated fraud detection and AML tests and KYC tests. And so, you know, you think about all the banks buying Ginnie Mae's in part in response to changes in supplemental leverage ratios. Banks are a big part of Ginnie Mae constituency on the investor side. So they obviously like the program, right? And so I think it's not easy, but incrementally working to see what you can do to get more banks as part of the um, suite of originators is something that will, um, that's a big enhancement to your program. And you know what Scott said in regards to the RFA, I think that there's technology, there's innovation, creativity, and then there's things that are abusive, that sort of where a few bad actors with not a lot of volume can impact the marginal price and impact the mortgage rate to millions of people. And that's the role you have to, you know, that's where you guys need to step in and police these programs. But it's not easy because you don't control VA guidelines. And so you have, you have a certain set of very powerful tools, but you don't have everything. Good way to conclude. I appreciate uh, all this 100 years of free advice <laughs> and insight to our, 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 our channel out there. Thank you very much.